people in the audience from around the world, some from uh, the Southern Hemisphere. So welcome to our uh, Salem Society Archaeological Institute of America presentation today. My name is Scott Pike, as it says on, uh, on Zoom, on the, my little box here. I'm the president of the Salem Society of the AIA. I'm also a professor at Willamette University in geoarchaeology. My home base is in the environmental science department. And with my colleague, Anne Nagorski, we sort of uh, manage, or mostly Anne manages the archaeology major that we have on campus. Uh, and it's my pleasure to, to welcome all of you tonight. Uh, it's my duty to speak a little bit about the AIA, since they are the sponsor of tonight's talk, as well as the funding body for tonight's talk. Uh, the AIA is the oldest and largest archaeological organization in the United States, it started in 1879, and it has a membership of over 200,000 people uh, spread out through over 100 societies in North America, in Europe, and I think there might be an Asian society now as well. That's a newer society, I'll have to confirm that. Uh, one, the mission of the AIA is to support archaeology, both through uh, grants and, and scholarships for students and scholars uh, to do archaeology. They have a very strong interest in preserving archaeological sites, uh, and they also have a very strong interest in promoting the education of archaeology. And through that interest, we have these wonderful lecture series that the AIA sponsors, where we are, you know, as we've been discussing, usually bring speakers to our societies to give talks, but because of the pandemic and the restrictions on crowd gathering, uh, we've been doing the Zoom lectures this year with some success. I mean, one of the advantages of Zoom is that we can have guests from Australia join us. So there are some benefits to this uh, virtual presentation. Uh, one thing I do want to stress about the AIA, it is a membership driven organization uh, and we are always canvassing new members. And if you are interested in joining, uh, the membership is actually not very expensive. I had pulled up the flyer right before joining the Zoom meeting uh, and the membership is only $50 a year now, unless you're a professional, it's $150. So they get us uh, if you have to join, but if you want to join and you don't need to professionally, uh, it's only a $50 a year membership. And what that membership provides you is one, the knowledge that you are supporting archeology, span uh, both locally and internationally. You are also given a subscription to archeology span magazine, which my camera won't focus on, but here it is. Anyway, trust me, I'm holding it. Uh, and uh, you, uh, it's a, a several uh, issues are, are given, sent out each year uh, with the latest developments in archaeology. And if you are able to go on an AIA tour, you even get $100 off your first AIA tour. So uh, you do get plenty of benefits with that. If you are already a member, one of the things we also really encourage our membership to do is to donate a membership for one of our undergraduate students. Uh, a member, a student membership is only $25. Uh, and what we would like to do is really encourage our archaeology students and our classic students to, uh, to join this professional organization early in their career to follow the, the recent trends in archaeology and to apply for grants and scholarships. And one of the best ways for them to be connected to archaeology is to actually join a professional organization. So if you are interested in donating, I will put my address in a moment into the chat and you can send me an email and we can coordinate that way. Again, it's only $25. So we would very much appreciate that and the students would appreciate that even more. Uh, so that's all I'm gonna say. Uh, I'm going to pass the baton over to uh, Professor Robert Chenault uh, at Willamette, and he has the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker. Rob? 
Thank you, Scott, and welcome everyone to our third and final archaeology lecture of the fall semester. My name is Rob Chenault, and I'm an associate professor of history and classical studies at Willamette University, as well as the program coordinator of the Salem AIA. Um, looking ahead to the spring semester, I'm pleased to report that we currently have two lectures scheduled, one in February and one in March. Um, as was mentioned before, our hope is that both of these lectures can be in-person events. Um, so fingers crossed that this will be our last uh, Zoom lecture and that we'll, we'll be able to return to our usual venue at the law school next semester. Tonight, we extend a warm digital welcome to Dr. Morag Kersel of DePaul University, where she is Associate Professor of Anthropology. Dr. Kersel earned a PhD in archeology span from the University of Cambridge and holds master's degrees from the University of Georgia and the University of Toronto. Her research interests include the Neolithic, the Chalcolithic, and early Bronze Age of the Eastern Mediterranean and Levant, cultural heritage protection, the built environment, object biographies, museums, and archaeological tourism. Her work combines archaeological, archival, and oral history research in order to understand the efficacy of cultural heritage law in protecting archaeological landscapes from looting. She also works on the public display and interpretation of archaeological artifacts in institutional spaces. Dr. Carousel has published a number of articles and is the co-author uh, with Christina Luke of U.S. Cultural Diplomacy and Archaeology, Soft Power, Hard Heritage, published in 2013, and co-editor with M.T. Rutz of Archaeologies of Text, Archaeology, Technology, and Ethics, published in 2014. She has participated in archaeological excavations and surveys in Egypt, Greece, Israel, Jordan, Palestine, and Turkey. Her lecture this evening will discuss her current work as the co-director of the Galilee Prehistory Project and the Follow the Pots Project, which traces the movement from the mound to the mantelpiece of early Bronze Age pots from the Dead Sea Plain in Jordan. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kersel. Oh, thank you, everyone. Um, and sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not going to talk about the Galilee Prehistory Project because that's not as exciting for me. So I'm going to do something more exciting. Um, hang on, I'm just going to, as as everyone will tell you, share my screen if I can do this properly. Here we go. Yes. Excellent. There we are. So I'm super happy to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, to the Salem Society for the invitation to share some of my research. And really, I have to give it up to Rowan Barton of Willamette because I would not be here if they had not contacted me about A68S, which will become clear to all of us. But right now, only a few in this August room, Zoom room, know what this is about. So I come to you today as a guest living and working in the traditional homelands of the Miami, the Kickapoo, the Peoria, and the Three Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. The city of Chicago remains a contested land in the Pokagon band of the Potawatomi per, per the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, and they continue to claim legal rights over the lands. To support First Nations, sovereignty and self-determination and education, I encourage you to donate to the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology at the University of Alberta to support their important work on bringing the children home. So as Rob mentioned, I do archival, I'm an anthropologist, so I do ethnography, I do archeology, span I do all kinds of things, but I have to start with a few disclaimers. And I know that someone in that audience is already laughing at my hands because I also speak with my hands. So I'm just gonna out myself now before Sarah does. All right, so um, I have, uh, ethical review protocol for all the research I do. It has been, all of my research protocols have been vetted by various ethical review boards. So I have IRB pro, um, approval and I don't do anything unethically. I have approval for oral consent, not written consent, because a lot of what people are telling you, which will become clear, is that they're doing illegal things. So that'll become clear. I've also tried to credit all of the images I'm using today um, they, so that there is no copyright infringement. 
hopefully, um, I think there are a few images of human remains. I never show our ancient ancestors without careful consideration, but I work at a looted cemetery site and it's very difficult not to show them because they are littering the surface, which will also become clear as we go through this. So this is an inclusive approach, one big group project, which I'm convinced archeology span is, and no one can convince me otherwise, um, that includes archeological evidence, archival documentation, interviews, and aerial surveys. So we've been using UAVs or drones, as uh, they might be more commonly referred to. I work in Jordan, Israel, and the Palestinian territories, and I am really interested in how artifacts go from the ground to the consumer, or the mound to the mantelpiece both the individual and institutional acquisition of these um, looted materials, because they get laundered along the way, which will also become clear. So I do this work, as I said, it's one big group project. I do it collaboratively with Jamila Ishtaway from the Jordanian Department of Antiquities, with Chad Hill from the University of Pennsylvania, and with Meredith Chesson of the University of Notre Dame. At the moment, we are collaborating on the Follow the Pots and the Landscapes of the Dead projects. Okay, so I said, we're interested in figuring out how artifacts go from, oh, I should have gone back. You can see this very meta photograph of Chad taking a photo of a pot and I'm taking a photo of Chad taking a photo of the pot and those are the pots that everybody wants. And um, how I came about this research, I did my PhD on the legal trade of antiquities in Israel. It's legal to buy and sell antiquities, which I'll go, to, uh, go into in a little bit more detail um, later on. Uh, but a lot of the material for sale is not from Israel. It's definitely the pots from the Dead Sea Plain are very unique and they come from Jordan. So somehow the pot has gone from across an international border from one country to the other and now is legally available for sale. So part of our project is to try and figure out how that happens in um, the marketplace. But as Rowan contacted me because she uh, did a Google search of follow, follow the pots, People are always contacting me. This is an image from the Vatican Museum. Someone was there and saw one of my tomb groups there. So then of course I had to go to Rome to follow that pot. You know, COVID's really done a number on my following pots. Now I'm just doing it all on um, online, but I did manage to get to the Vatican and that's a topic we can, uh, in question and answer, I can fill you in on how it got to the Vatican because that's also kind of an interesting story. Uh, or the mantelpiece, and I apologize for the quality of this slide. Somehow when I open uh, the uh, digital, something happened to the resolution in opening this to the mantelpiece. So private individuals are buying these things or institutions. I think Rowan, you can correct me if I'm wrong. This might be one of your pots because I'm borrowing your and I should have an image credit and I don't and that's bad. So I will do that in future. So there are, along the Dead Sea Plain in Jordan, there are a series of early Bronze Age sites, and that's from about 3600 to about 2000 BCE. They're thought to be, uh, thought by some to be the cities of the plain that are mentioned in Genesis, although we've never had any signs saying this is biblical um, numera or anything like that. But uh, formal excavations at sites like Baba Dra have indicated that these sites can be both mortuary and domestic. So some of the sites are cemeteries only, well, to the best of our knowledge, because we have not investigated them all completely. And some of them are both cemeteries and where people are living. So today we're gonna concentrate on Baba Dra, which is both a cemetery and a mort uh, mortuary site and a domestic site, and Faifa, which is only a cemetery that we know of at the moment. So during this period, the dead were buried. And I have to say, because there are so many people buried at these sites, uh, people were bringing their dead from somewhere else. Uh, and this, uh, in, at these sites, the dead are buried in a secondary context. So they are defleshed somewhere else and then their long bones and their skulls are brought to the sites and buried in cis tombs. And you can see in this reconstruction by Eric Carlson, a cis tomb, which is a stone lined tomb that has slabs on top. You can see the, bio, uh, the pile of crania and then the long bones. And then you can see the pots just around them. So they're buried with grave goods as well. 
but they're also buried and at Baba Dra, they're buried in shaft tombs where you have a central shaft and then you have um, little chambers off to the side. And one of your, your tomb group is from one of the chambers like this, A68S, so the south one. But the same sort of thing where you have a pile of secondary burial and then the grave goods all around them. So everybody's buried with the same toolkit, right? Mortuary toolkit. Everybody gets between three or six and 30 pots. Sometimes they get a basalt bull, sometimes they get a lamb shell bracelet, which is up here in the corner, which indicates long distance trade. The lamb shell probably is coming from the Red Sea. I know that Julian's here today and he's doing his MA thesis on these little beauties. These are carnelian beads. And the, um, this also indicates long distance trade. If you have questions about that, I'm gonna let Julian take the lead on that because I'm not the material culture specialist. I'm the people person, <laughs> which will become clear um, because it is one big group project, right? Okay, so everybody's buried with the same thing, uh, with the same mortuary toolkit. As one of the cities of the plain, Baba Dra has been identified by some as biblical Sodom. Okay, of Sodom and Gomorrah, Numera might be Gomorrah and Baba Dra might be biblical Sodom. But it's not the only biblical Sodom out there because um, another group who are working at Tel El Hamam um, have also identified their site as biblical Sodom, you can see on the map. But for our purposes, what's really important about whether or not we are identifying things as biblical Sodom or Gomorrah is that um, headlines like these increase people's interest in buying pots from the city of sin. And that's a direct quote that I have had from a informant in, in an interview setting in the old city in Jerusalem. So, while we might debate the existence of biblical cities, really for my purposes and for the purposes of the project, it's this kind of headline and these kinds of stories that drive the market in the materials in the old city. Demand for these artifacts, and you can see some of the pots here, leads to looting at a site like Baba Dra. And this is an aerial photograph from the drone. You can see all of those holes. Those are all looters holes. So that's what the sites look like and they're, it's heartbreaking. So after consultation with the Department of Antiquities in Jordan in June of 2013, we launched the Landscapes of the Dead Project, Chad and I, aimed at archeological site monitoring and assessment. So we proposed that every year we would go back to the site at the same time and fly drones, produce maps and uh, monitor change over time. Not just change both um, anthropogenic or um, cultural change, but also natural change, anything that was happening to the landscape. At the same time, I would do pedestrian surveys and also ethnographic surveys with people who were interacting with the landscape, but also with buyers in the Jerusalem market or in the licensed market in Israel. So Chad, who has been an air, a model airplane enthusiast and a camera buff since he was a kid, um, in our first year, built all the equipment. You can see the GoPro on the front doing the um, video feed. And then inside the body of the plane, we have a Canon S100 pointing straight down and it's taking an image every two to three seconds. And then Chad at the end of the day goes back and um, stitches it together and we can look and make sure that we have a complete map. But, and we can also see, we can look for anomalies, which we have found. Sometimes I get to hold the plane. All right. So here is footage from the drone. We have upgraded to a um, DJI Phantom. So we've been a beta tester for a lot of their models because Chad's really into this kind of stuff. Um, so, and we crashed that last one. So, you know, um, we, have, we have moved up from handmade to uh, store-bought. Um, so that is the site of FAFA that we were flying over. So between 2013 and 2014, there were 34 new holes at the site. And you can see them marked in an X here on our um, digital elevation model. Between 2014 and 15, there were only three new holes. And so we had been working with the Petra National Trust on an outreach program called um, Why Looting Matters with their um, scout troops, uh, both men or boys and girls. 
um, to talk to people, both uh, younger people and their parents about why looting matters and why we shouldn't be doing it and how they interact with the site. So um, we thought our program was working. Um, but sadly, no, because the next year there are 24 new holes. Uh, so we don't really have an explanation for why. But we now have a total of 61 new holes at the site. So looting is ongoing and the Department of Antiquities, because I know you're all wondering what they're doing about it. They are absolutely always trying to stop looting at these sites. But the um, networks for the movement of antiquities are so entrenched and they're so community driven that sometimes it's beyond them to stop the looting. Um, but let me just quantify this for you. So if we have 61 new holes, and I told you that everybody's buried with between six and 30 pots, that could be as few as 366 pots or as high as just over 1800 pots with a low estimate of around $10,000 because each pot sells for between uh, um, 50 and $150 to a high estimate of $275,000. So there's money to be made at the site, even though I know when you were looking at the DEMs, like here, you're wondering if there's anything left to loot here, <laughs> but there is, there really is. So since 1989, and that's when this looting really started in earnest at, at the site of FAFA, there have, we've documented over 3,700 kits, which means between 22,000 and over 111,000 pots. Looters make between four and $7 per pot, right? So Neil Brody has done a lot of study on how much looters make, and it's usually less than 1% of the eventual sale price. The pots sell between $30 and $150. So in Jordan, looters from the number of pots could make anywhere between $88,000 and $777,000 since 1989. But in the marketplace abroad, it's a whopping $670,000 or $16.7 million. And that's just for these pots, which only a mother can love, or Rowan Barton. Or, or, or Julian Hirsch. There's not many people who love these things or Meredith as much as we do, but because they have that biblical connotation of Sodom, they're hot sell ticket items. So sometimes Chad and I encounter people in the field and one day we were um, setting up our targets for our drone flyover and off in the distance that we could see this dirt flying up. And I said to Chad, that can't possibly be what I think it is. Um, and we work in the field with a um, Department of Antiquities representative. And that day our department rep, uh, Jihad Darwish, his car had broken down on the highway. And so he wasn't with us in the field. Um, and I will say, I have all of my materials um, translated into Arabic, but my Arabic, if I'm doing an interview, I usually have a translator with me. So we walked over and sure enough, there were two looters. You can see the other gentleman in here and then this guy. Um, and in our pidgin Arabic English, he asked if we were there to loot because they could help us find a good spot. And we asked what, you know, what they were doing. Um, I will say as an anthropologist, my first um, alliance is to my informants. It's not my job to have them arrested, but it is Jihad Darwish's job. So. In true uh, landscapes of the dead fashion, we had forgotten something that belonged on the drone. So we had to drive back to our um, base camp. And so we left the looters there, but we called Jihad to tell him that they were there. And in the interim, he arrived and he had them arrested. They spent the night in jail and then they were back out there the next day. In question and answer, we can talk about determent, but uh, in deterrence, um, because uh, the laws are not, um, anyway, we can talk about that. But they told us, you know, they use the same tools as everybody in other places. I'm sure if you work in Italy or in Greece or in Central and South America, you've seen these tools, usually a pokey tool. They told us that they look for these big black stones. And these are the markers of where graves will be. Now, whether the stones, which are not local to the area, were upright and standing at some point, I don't know. But um, that's what they're looking for. And then they take their tool and they poke holes into the ground and they're looking for the capstones. 
this is, you know, not easy work. Those capstones are huge. And so it takes a lot of effort to dig down into one of these, remove the capstone and get the grave goods. I'm here to tell you that if you walk on this landscape, you will see humans everywhere because they don't take the humans. They rarely take the carnelian beads or the lambishell bracelets or anything else. They really only want the pots. And that is all related to consumer demand, which, we, which I will talk about. So that day, those guys had recovered three pots. And there's Jihad who had uh, confiscated the pots and they were um, then deposited in the museum at the lowest place on earth, which is the museum, the regional museum for this site. All right, so we took the opportunity to ask them what happens like when they find a pot, what happens? So they told us that big black cars from Amman come to the site every couple of weeks and will buy their pots. So they know that from the big city of Amman and also sometimes from Karak, which is the next closest big city, that there's a steady um, purchaser who will come and pay them the four to seven dollars for the pots. So there's not, it's not wasted effort because they know that um, these things will then move somewhere else. So the people in the black cars take the pots to formerly licensed dealers in places like Karak and Amman. In 1976, Jordan banned the trade of antiquities. So it's no longer legal to buy and sell antiquities. But if you are Jordanian and you own some, you can register your collection with the Jordanian government and you can keep them, but you can't sell them and you're not supposed to be buying any. So once the pots are in Amman, they end up, they might end up in private collections because we really as researchers into this have no idea about the private sale of things because collector to collector or dealer to dealer, there's no record of that. And so there's a whole hidden market out there. So they might end up in um, Jordanian private collections or they change hands again on their way to places other where, other and elsewhere in the world. So I put this handy dandy little model together in the direction of movement from the mound to the mantelpiece. And you can see like down at the bottom, those are all the looters. And this is for the uh, region in general, not just for Jordan. But there are lots of hands that the material could pass through. And for our purposes, what's really important about this, um, this diagram is that these folks down here never come into contact with the people at the top. So they rarely ever come, into, there's never really direct sales. Uh, so they don't come into contact with the tourists, the museums, the educational institutions, or the high-end collectors. And it's in the middle portion of this, the distribution area, that the artifacts go from being illegal, because they're illegally dug up in Jordan, to legally available for sale in Israel. So that when these folks are buying from licensed dealers, they have no idea that they're buying a looted pot because it's already been laundered. When I started this research, people told me, and there's this prevailing sort of um, tall tale about how diplomats are moving ar artifacts and they're all moving in diplomatic pouches. So my idea of a diplomatic pouch is somebody's briefcase, but actually a shipping container can be a diplomatic pouch and they are immune from search and seizure. Um, and we have corroborating evidence for that actually happening with the Swedish ambassador to Peru who was moving Peruvian material back to Sweden in shipping containers. And he was, um, let's say, busted under a 60 minutes type uh, undercover operation, news program operation in the 1990s. But not only are artifacts moving across the border in shipping containers, they're also going in UN aid trucks and in also dealers from Jerusalem are going to Amman and picking them up. I had one dealer tell me that he got uh, a large, and I know you have one in your collection, a large early Bronze Age bowl that he then filled with fruit and wrapped in plastic and carried it across the border and no one ever stopped him. So the other thing I should tell you is that um, in my many conversations with Customs and Border Control in this country and with AUSAs who work to um, convict and um, catch people. The statistic of less than 10% of any items crossing any border in the world 
gets checked. So that means guns, arms, people, all of that stuff is not, that's how it's all getting through because less than 10% of items crossing borders is checked. But sometimes it does get checked. And here we have an example of um, a Egypt, uh, Italian diplomat who was smuggling Egyptian antiquities uh, in September of 2019. He was um, in Egypt notice, notified Interpol that the former Italian official should be added to their red notice and then he was caught at the border. But what really made my day was when the Norwegian ambassador's car was stopped at the um, land border between Jordan and Israel, the King Hussein or the Allenby Bridge driving over on a tip for the tax authorities. Somehow they got a tip, so they were allowed to stop the car. And in the side panels of the car, they found thousands of artifacts from Jordan traveling into Israel. How many times had that car passed through that checkpoint is our guess. Um, I don't want to cast aspersions on the Norwegian ambassador. He knew nothing about this. It was his driver who was moving the material. All right, so how does this work, the laundering bit? Because this is actually, when I wrote my dissertation, this was my eureka moment where I put together how these things were going from the ground to the consumer. In 1978, the, Israel, uh, the Antiquities Law of Israel established a state-sanctioned sale. So you can apply to sell artifacts, you pay a fee and you set up shop. So today or tomorrow, any one of us could buy an antiquity from a licensed dealer in Israel. We can receive an export license and we can legally take home our piece of the Holy Land. It's all legal. In the 15 years that I've been doing this research, I'm probably closer to 20 now, it's rare that I've met a tourist in the Holy Land who doesn't want a keepsake of their adventure. And typically, you know, that's a floating Last Supper pen or whatever, but sometimes it's an artifact, um, you know, that might've been held by someone from the Bible or from a site mentioned in the Bible. Under the 1978 law, the only way that artifacts should enter this market is if they predate the 1978 law. So they should already be in dealer collections and the dealer has to provide an itemized inventory to the Israel Antiquities Authority of their holdings. Or if they're part of a family collection, so if you are the grandson of Moshe Dayan, who was one of the biggest collectors of antiquities out there, and he left them to you, you could sell them to a dealer if you didn't want them anymore. Or if you're a museum and you have too many Middle Bronze Age jars and you want to deaccession some, those can enter the market. But those three ways are the only way new material. So stuff looted last week should not be entering the market. Stuff from Mesopotamia looted in post-2003 should not be entering the market, but it is. So in order to comply, as I said, you have to apply for, as a dealer, you have to apply for the license. You have to pay a thousand, like what is it? Um, around, now it's about a thousand dollars. You have to provide an itemized inventory of every single thing in your shop. But sometimes the inventory until recently could be handwritten ledger with a fuzzy image of a buff colored pot, right? Pretty nondescript, lots of buff colored pots out there and that's number 147. When people are buying antiquities, like all of us, they're really concerned that they're buying the real thing. So they want a certificate of authenticity and anyone who has a shop or anyone selling anything can make a certificate of authenticity. There's no oversight or issuing of those from the Israel Antiquities Authority. Um, but what they really need to ask for is an export license because due to a loophole in the law, the onus is on the buyer to ask for the export license. The dealer doesn't have to offer you one. And there's only one guidebook out there, the Blue Guide by Kay Prague, that actually says if you're gonna buy antiquities in the legal market, make sure you ask for an export license. If the tourist buys an oil lamp or a buff colored pot and doesn't ask for the export license, then the dealer doesn't have to call the Israel Antiquities Authority to get them to issue the license. So there's no record of that sale. 
which means, and, and I will say in only a couple of instances uh, of the 45 currently licensed shops, there are only a few that have signs saying, make sure you ask for an export license or, and they're not, or proactively telling you to get an export license. So if there's no record of the sale, the number 147 for the buff colored pot can be reused for another buff colored pot that was looted last week from my site at Faithful, right? Because there are thousands of buff colored pots. So that's how newly excavated, illegally excavated material is entering this closed system. So in order to tighten that loophole, in 2015, the Israel Antiquities Authority um, created a dedicated centralized database where dealers now, instead of having a mandate era handwritten ledger saying what their inventory is, they all now have to um, enter it into the central database. So that was uh, enacted, it started, so they passed a, an amendment to the law in 2015 to start this, but they didn't start putting it into action until 2015. They gave people enough time to inventory all of their materials and put it online. Um, and then in the last time I go every summer and I check in with all these folks, and the last time I was there is the summer of 2019. And it was still, still too soon to know, there weren't enough um, metrics to know whether or not this new system was working or had closed the loophole. Um, but maybe I'm hoping to head up uh, to take my first trip uh, post, and I'm not gonna say post COVID because we're not post COVID, but now that I'm boosted and everything to Jerusalem next month. And so I will check in and see where we are with the um, new database. All right, so once they're in the shops and they're for sale, everybody wants to own them, right? We're all buying things. For those of you who've been to Jerusalem, you know where the pathway that Christ walked on the Via Della Rosa, that's where the largest number of um, shops are, where all those little blue stars are. Uh, over, so I've become obsessed with talking to people about what they're buying because it's super interesting and people are really like quirky and they will tell me amazing stories. Um, and so I was able, and in doing that, I've been able to uh, categorize and group things together, both the types of shops and the types of tourists that want to buy in the particular shops. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here because that's a whole other story. Or if you're gonna be at ASOR next week, that's the topic of my poster, so drop by. Um, but so there are four different, I've identified four different categories, like the explorer who's younger and who's looking for a really authentic trip or um, an experience and they want something small and they usually want to buy in a shop that's um, the person's dressed like a Bedouin, the artifacts are dirty and uh, they get to, you know, they're in boxes and they get to sort of dig themselves to find something. They're looking for the total package. Whereas elite buyers are looking for objet d'art that are on beds of velvet that are sold. And um, there are two dealers who deal out of their home. And so it's very private. You don't really need other people or it's an art gallery type shop or a museum shop. They want high end, expensive, one of a kind. And they pay a lot of money for the real thing, right? The majority of the tourists are religious tourists where they will buy in cabinets of curiosity, but they are mostly on the religious paths, right? So they are looking for the tourist shop where in addition to buying a pot, you can get a t-shirt or a ball cap or a fridge magnet. You know, it's one-stop shopping. And they're always looking for something with a religious association. The last category is us today. So our common denominator here is what Scott mentioned, you get $100 off if you go on an AIA tour, right? So if we all went to Israel on an AIA tour, we would, our common denominator would be that we're all members of the AIA. Right? So the charter tours are folks, they're not bound together by religion, they're common. Um, or if you, if, if Willamette has a tour, then you're all bound by that, right? That's your common denominator. So these folks will shop wherever their tour guide drops them. And you know that tour guides get a percentage or a cut from whatever gets sold in the shop. And most people, uh, dealers have told me that if a charter tour comes into their shop and one person buys an oil lamp, everybody buys one. 
So it only takes one person, but there's a lot of like peer pressure, I guess, unintended or whatever. So um, uh, yes, but they will buy, um, so they'll buy um, anything related to anything that anybody else buys or what their tour guide tells them. Okay, so they're buying lots of stuff. They buy what uh, archaeologist Nelson Grayburn or anthropologist Nelson Grayburn has referred to as they want, it has to be cheap, portable, dustable, and understandable. So that when you go back home and you put it on your mantle, someone asks you what it is and you get to relive the moment and tell the story of bartering for an oil lamp on a really hot day in July in the old city. And I mean, it's really this memento of this moment. And if there is a biblical association, all the better, right? And this may have come from the site that, you know, Abraham was at. One of the interesting things, oh, sorry. But one of the most interesting things that I ask is that almost nobody wants to buy a replica. These are also made in the Holy Land. <laughs> they're, they're made in Hebron. I've been to the cottage industries where they make these things. But nobody wants a replica, except for me, because they only cost two dollars and bring them home and everybody's happy with them. But people who were actually visiting there, very few people will buy a replica. But look, we don't even have to go there anymore, right? We can all just buy it on eBay and you can type after we finish up here, I encourage you to just type in early Bronze Age and lots of pots will pop up and you can see the range of prices everywhere from like 68 pounds to $750, which is a lot of money. And, um, but like anything, both here and in the actual market in uh, Israel, it's a buyer beware situation because there are fakes out there. And I've been in the old city with one of the leading experts in early Bronze Age, Elliot Braun. And he said to me, you know, I can't tell if this is real or not. And if Elliot Braun can't tell it's real, you might be buying a fake. Uh, so just, uh, and if you're, oh yeah, from the comfort of your own home. And if you're buying, you always wanna be thinking about the destruction that's being wrought back at the site in order to feed that demand because it is demand driven looting. There's no other word for it. Okay, but the reason you all are here from Oregon is that there are other ways that these pots have moved around. And um, this is where it becomes more interesting for you who have a tomb group. So I want to discuss this other way that allows for the movement of these pots from Baba Dra. So between 1965 and 1967, Paul Lapp, who you can see here, under the auspices of the American School of Oriental Research, now called the American Society of Overseas Research, excavated a number of tombs at the early Bronze Age site of Baba Dra. So Paul and his merry band of folks, uh, including a lot of luminaries like the Tom and Marilyn Schaub, Walt Rast, Susan Culp, Howard Jameson, and Fuad Zogby, um, did a lot of excavation, including, and I know that you, many of you know Dave McCreary, but Dave was involved in later excavations at the site, not in these first iterations, right? So this is pre-67 more just to situate us. And this is the pot that started it all. And I know that you have one that's similar, not with that little uh, thing on it, but with the punctuated uh, rim. So in response to a flood of pots like this in the Jerusalem market, Paul Carey and his team decided to go to Baba Dra and to assess the situation and to excavate the uh, intact tombs. This is one of the pots that was shown to Paul and the person told them that it came from biblical saw, right? So I will say that Nancy, Paul's widow, uh, has donated this piece to the Kelso Museum at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And it, it's one of the only pots that has this figurative decoration around the uh, rim. So this is, See, I want to show you the similarity between um, your pot. So I know, um, so in following these pots, they are now in a variety of places, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. But what I wanted to show you here is 
Rowan's entry of this Baba Draw bowl from the tune group that's very similar to the one that started it all. So you have one of these very unique ones. So during the excavation, Paul and his group recovered thousands of pots. They did a lot of excavating. And as I said, you can have upwards of 30 pots in every tomb or even more. If it's a uh, shaft tomb, you have um, hundreds of pots. And sadly, Paul passed away unexpectedly in 1970, leaving his widow, Nancy, to deal with the legacy of all of his various excavations, because he wasn't just excavating at Baba Dry, he was working at all kinds of other sites, including this, this early Bronze Age material. And it was this material that Dave McCreary was concerned about the conservation of, and it's the conditions under which it was being kept. So what was Nancy supposed to do with all the uncurated, unexamined, and unloved pots from Baba Dra? There are thousands of them from the 1960s. And it's in an archival letter from Dave to Nancy, where he raised the issue of storage and the risk of this material, which led Dave, Nancy, and Asor to a very unusual decision. In 1977, the Jordanian Department of Antiquities, Dave McCreary and Nancy Lapp devised a plan whereby tomb groups from the original Lapp excavations would be sold to American schools of Oriental Research member institutions for the purposes of education and display. This satisfied the growing demand for teaching and display materials, while at the same time freeing up scarce, scarce storage space in Jordan. For the government of Jordan, you might wonder what was their impetus like? Why would they agree to this? This is their cultural heritage. Why would they agree to sell it or to allow it to leave the country? They thought, and we have some really great archival letters, they thought that the pots would act like ambassadors. So you would see a pot on display somewhere, the Vatican, and you would think, wow, that's pretty interesting. I should go to Jordan and see the site it came from. So they were happy to let them go. There was also a plan to increase interest in Jordanian archaeology and encourage more cooperative archaeological efforts between foreign institutions and Jordan. So as I said, the pots acted as ambassadors. So I think that this quote, uh, which comes directly from one of the archival letters, we feel, and this is if you were um, Will Amet, you would be getting this. We feel that the opportunity has come, an opportunity has come up, which will be of great interest to many ASOR member schools. Please give this letter serious consideration right away, because we must act within the next 60 days for the sake of all concerned. It makes me think like when, you know, Ron Popeil or whatever, you know, one of those home shopping buying things, like you have to act now or you'll miss out. <laughs> So uh, for anywhere between $100 and $1,500, institutional members of ASOR were offered tomb groups from chambers and charnel houses. And the ASOR decision makers like Nancy and Dave chose institutions based on a wide regional distribution. There's an amazing archival letter where basically Nancy says, everything is not gonna end up at the Harvards and Yales and it has to go to small seminaries. So that's where our smaller schools. Many of the successful institutions were small seminaries and liberal arts colleges, ensuring that the access to material from uh, that there was access to material for students from Australia, from Canada, and from the United States. Twenty-four institutions received group, and a further fifteen were unsuccessful in their bid to try and get one. The obligations for owning or for uh, getting one of these tomb groups were the following. So the tomb group had to remain intact. You couldn't divide it. You had to keep it all as one. The pots should be, should be publicly displayed with the proper attribution. They should be available for study to those responsible for the publication of Baba Dra. And I will say that was Walt and Tom, and they did publish in 1989, the results of the 60s excavations. And the charge for the collection had to be paid in a full and timely manner. So there was nothing about selling. It was all these euphemisms for the exchange of money. This was one of my best finds in following the pots. At the McCormick Seminary, they have A65 West. 
and they have their tomb group in their coffee table in their lounge. You can see the original excavator here and the pots in situ with the people and then the pots from their tomb group around it in their glass topped coffee table. Awesome. I thought I was going to McCormick to see it in a display and I did not realize it was going to have coffee. There was a no questions asked return policy and that turned out to be a good thing because the Lowy Museum at Berkeley decided they didn't like their pots and there are also great archival letters about uh, from the curator who felt duped because they were sent miniatures, which are very rare, but they wanted to know uh, why anyone would think these were displayable. They were awful. They were too small and no one could see them. So they sent them back and I'm um, happy to tell you that Andrews University loves their miniatures. So they have them on display. So as part of this work, I have been trying to track whether or not these pots are in their original locations. Because one of the arguments that is made about selling antiquities is that once they get sold, we never know where they go. And then science changes and we can do residue analysis, but we no longer have access to the original materials. So if we know exactly where these 24 tomb groups are, then we maybe can think about distributing, and I don't mean by selling them, I mean maybe distributing them to other educational institutions where they can be used in classroom settings. Because as someone who teaches, we don't have a tomb group at um, DePaul. There are three tomb groups in the city of Chicago, but they're on the south side. And so I have to get my students to come down to the south side. So of the 24, I have tracked 23. And with Rowan's help, I now know that the Claremont University, and we're in the process, um, she and I, of changing the entry for tomb group A68S, because now that tomb group is with you. So it's moved, which is not, um, it isn't really what originally Nancy envisioned, but we know because of all the great documentation you have exactly why it moved and that it's all together and that it's being used for educational purposes, which fulfills all the other obligations. So that's why you have it there. And I've just um, spent, I was on leave last year and I spent a lot of the year working on the website for Follow the Pots. So it's now much more robust than it has been. But ultimately I wanna leave you with the parting uh, reminder that when you desire a pot from the city of the sin, as one of my informants told me, you get broken pots on the surface, which is less than ideal, but you get heartbreaking people also on the surface, which is really not ideal. And you have Jordanians now unable to access their historic past because it's completely destroyed. All right, so I encourage you to check out Follow the Pots. Um, so followthepotsproject.org. You can click on any one of these things and it'll pop up. You can also click on more information on the, all the other stuff we're doing. Um, see, this is why we got people coming because I'll post it on Facebook. I have a pretty active Follow the Pots Project Facebook page, which uh, disseminates lots of information, but I thought the poster was so great. I want to put it up there. Um, and this Facebook page was recently described as a nerdy Facebook group with a lot of cool content. So if you're about that, come on down. <laughs> Um, I'm also pretty active on Twitter and um, use the hashtag follow the pots and so uh, and I do this because this is how people find me and tell me oh I was at the Vatican oh I was in Belgium and I found a tomb group oh I was here and so um, I'm super happy to have the social media as one of my outlets now. All right, so I'd be nowhere without the kindness of strangers and people agree to talk to me all the time. I'm always badgering people and I really appreciate it. Um, and especially the communities of uh, Faifa, Safi and Mazur where we've been hanging out. Um, sadly, Tom and Walt and Marilyn have all passed away, but I had great pleasure to meet them uh, in earlier days. And Nancy, who was in her 90s, is still a firebrand and she's amazing, amazing font of information. We've worked with lots of uh, other folks and I'm really appreciative. You can see these are all big looters pits that folks James standing next to. And 
none of this research is free. Uh, so I have to thank my many sponsors because I've been very uh, lucky to get um, to have support for this research. And as I said, we've usually been a um, beta tester for DGI different phantoms. Um, I also want to do a shout out for the Vintage Radio Control Society because Chad has been a member since he was five and he gives a lecture like this to them. And I think they never thought radio control planes would be used to monitor looting in Jordan <laughs> or to monitor site change. Um, but I think they find it pretty interesting. And then I'm going to leave it there and I would be happy to answer any questions that you all might have. And I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yes, stop sharing. There we go. Yeah. And then you also. Thank you for all the little hands. <laughs> <laughs> it's very heartwarming. <laughs> that was pretty cool. So anybody who has questions is more than welcome to start. Yeah. I'll ask a question. <laughs> Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Ann Nagorski and I'm the curator at the museum that's been working with uh, Rowan on this project and um, it's really great to see how much she's been able to discover and I thank you for corresponding with her about this. Um, yeah, so I, I had the pleasure of unpacking these pot, pots when they first arrived at the museum in the in the middle of COVID and, <laughs> and no one else was allowed in. And so it was, they all arrived along with some other interesting antiquities as well. Uh, but I wanted to also just let you know that um, there's also another pot at the museum that clearly comes from Baba Dra that came in, uh, from another collector in Florida who's a Willamette alum. Uh, and it is, of course, the classic, you know, bowl with the, the uh, pointillism on the, on the rim. It looks like it's been acid washed. It comes from some kind of antiquities dealer. But yeah, I just, I, I didn't even know it was there. One day I saw it in the in the processing room and I was like, where did that come from? <laughs> I mean, I know where it comes from, but how did it get here? So, so we do have another one that you might want to uh, consider at some point. Yeah, oh, thank thanks. you so much. Really yeah. interesting. Thanks for um, that. I will follow up with you or with Rowan to figure out what, um, what it is or when it came into being and where the person because yeah. that person it would be for me really interesting if they bought it in Jerusalem that would be super interesting <laughs> feel like. yeah we can probably ask about that <laughs> I mean because it's not legal it's not illegal and so it's usually people are very willing to say oh yeah I bought it and I've spent blah blah blah, blah. um mm -hmm. Uh, one of the other things that I found fascinating that Rowan uncovered that I didn't know much about because uh, they also did some interviews with Dave McCreary was about your earthquake. And I don't want to out it because I know they are going to write it up so we can put it on the um, follow the pots page, but that's super interesting as well. So the pots have been broken in antic or, uh, in recent times because you suffered or California suffered an earthquake and then um, they were glued back together. Which is, mm -hmm super interesting sort of, if you think about the lifetime of that pot, what it's been through. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because we were able to confirm that by some uh, analysis of the glue, and discovery of different types of glue on the, on the pots. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Rowan has, has done a fantastic job and I don't think she's done yet. Still more to discover. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. I, I am, if you don't mind, I am curious, um, are the ceramics and the pots that we're looking at of local fabric material, are there any imports from other regions as far as clays and uh, styles? Are they just specifically local to this region? Uh, so excellent question. Um, and I will say, so one of the failings in archaeology, um, and I'm just going to speak about FAFA right now, uh, which has really been my area of interest and Meredith has really been more Babadra. Um, 
is that uh, while Tom and Walt did some excavations at Faifa of 12 tombs in 89, you might think, is there a correlation with their uh, um, interaction with the landscape and the start of looting? Correct. We as archaeologists should be thinking about that, right? Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, but that's that stuff has never been published. So that's one of the things that we're committed to doing is doing the legacy publications. And Walt and Tom had an NEH and they did do um, provenience analysis, but we are in the process of unpacking and we have an archival project to figure out where all the notes are. So I can't really right. answer that question right now. Um, I, uh, so I don't even want to speculate, but maybe I know Julian's been doing a deep dive and if maybe he has something to add, he could um, jump in, not to put you on the spot or anything, Julian, but you may have come across something. Oh, well, I, I only do beads. Right. That's, that's fine. Okay, so basically, Brian, no one can answer your question because, first of all, we as archaeologists uh, should be better about publication and uh, doing publishing, uh, and we haven't been. And um, Meredith's not here to answer the deep dive about Baba Drop. Well, and, and and to be honest, I mean, ceramics is both the boon and the bane of archaeology. There's so much of it everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and because people are bringing their dead, so Arad is not that far away, which is a huge right. early Bronze Age site, and um, so people are bringing their dead from somewhere else because there right. are lots of people buried at Faifa, but we have not found any domestic occupation in the region, and so mm -hmm. maybe they're bringing their pots, or maybe there's somebody with a stand selling pots when people bring their dead. I don't, I mm -hmm. don't really have a, an idea yet. That's interesting, like a vendor. Yeah, like a, yeah, it's one stop wow. shop. When you're dead, you can buy a pot. <laughs> so, these, if I may actually add to that, um, these pots don't show any uh, traces of use. Like, if you actually have a cooking pot, then you would probably find a lot of soot at the bottom and so on. Yeah. Right. Oh, look, Rowan's put something in the chat right there. Tempering types and sources for early Bronze Age ceramics, right there. See? Oh, I am going um, to copy and paste that right now. Uh, and again, uh, they also did some residue analysis and we have not really any, nothing like lipids or fats or anything like that. Um, not and, even pollen or? Uh, not that I know of, but you know, most of this stuff was done a long time ago, right? And our scientific methodologies have changed to a standard now where we probably could identify right. more. Right. But this was done in the late 80s. Um, and then the Baba Dross uh, yeah. stuff was done in the middle 80s. Yeah, the, 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 the whole reason I'm sticking on the whole pots and you know, domestic versus international thing is um, I was uh, uh, with the University of Pennsylvania in Yale. Uh, I was a ceramicist at Abydos in Egypt. And my whole thing was ceramics and pots. and examining fabrics and styles and doing the whole you know diagnostics of measurements and volume um, and decoration sometimes uh, and you know we, we found a lot of variation of course regional variation uh, within the fabrics of nilotic clays but we got nilotic stylistic clays uh, from Nubia we also got them from the Levant as well and uh, those of you who might not be familiar with Abydos, Abydos is like smack dab in the middle of the Nile Valley. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're getting, you know, during the 18th dynasty, 19th dynasty, and later, we're getting these international styles and international fabrics and shapes and forms um, with really kind of no context in some cases, like, like you had mentioned um, earlier, you know, you, you do see uh, broken bones and broken pots on the surface mm -hmm. at Abydos. Um, and so it's, it's really hard to kind of contextualize what you're seeing in the archeological record and trying to fit that into some sort of sensible um, overall view of what, what's actually going on, uh, mm -hmm. not only with international trade and economies, but you know, what materials are available you know, who is getting this clay that is not native to Egypt? Why are we getting clays that are 
triggered or you know or, or um, coming in from Assyria. What's hmm. the context? It's uh, it, it's absolutely fascinating. So I'm I'm definitely a pots guy. Okay. <laughs> so did I answer Sarah's question about the resale of looted materials? Sure. Okay, so Sarah's asking about, curious about the resale of looted materials among consumers, like after it ends up in somebody's mantelpiece, what happens to it later? Uh, is there any way to trace how it circulates among consumers, families, examples, or do these pots lose meaning and turn into junk that gets discarded? Great question. And it's rare in my experience that I have been in a Jordanian family's house where I haven't seen one of these pots. And mm -hmm. I think they are still moving within families because they're still treasured, cherished things. But I, um, the longitudinal aspect of this study is such that, you know, most of the people that I've spoken to about what they bought in the old city, it's been since 2015. And so to follow up with them now about what to do, I mean, that's uh, something that I'd be interested in knowing what happened to it when, you know, if somebody passed away or did it, is it just junk? And I think a lot of times it is just junk because they're not very beautiful pots. Um, mm -hmm. And for people who haven't traveled to the area or maybe somebody who's not that interested in the Bible, they don't have as much meaning. So I think, um, and I will say, um, when I was doing my PhD in England, I worked at the Save the Children charity shop and we get, we didn't get any Baba Drop pots, but we would get artifacts that clearly people didn't know what to do with and they wanted to just to donate them to a charity shop, so. Mm -hmm. I go to a lot of estate sales and I find especially South American and Middle American artifacts there. And I know that Andy Gorski has found um, Mesoamerican spindle walls and stuff like that in uh, um, resale shops as well. So you can find all, all kinds of things that um, clearly are not meaningful to the descendants of the people whose stuff is sold at those estate sales. And so they just end up and maybe people know what they are and maybe they don't. Uh, excellent question about basalt vessels. Um... So there aren't very many basalt vessels in the tombs. Usually there's only one and they're not in every single tomb that, um, because the basalt is also not local and it's pretty heavy. So it's prestige. And I live in my household with someone who wrote their PhD on basalt vessels. So <laughs> I talk about these things all the time. So, <laughs> um, so I have not seen as many basalt vessels in the marketplace. And when I see them, same with the Lamba shell bracelets, because I'm here to tell you that the most intriguing thing that people are buried with are those Lamba shell bracelets. They're gorgeous. I mean, they fit on your wrist and they're um, usually have some incised design. They're gorgeous. I have visited the same dealer since 2002 and he has the same Lamba shell bracelet that he has dropped the price of every year. He still can't move it. So if you're a tourist, you're not gonna buy a basalt bowl because they're really heavy. You don't want a um, Lamba shell bracelet for whatever reason. Nobody except for Julian loves the carnelian beads, which is unfortunate because they're also pretty, pretty spectacular. It's really just about the pots. And so I don't see in any of the other materials moving around. Coins, coins must be pretty popular too, right? I mean, that was what you found in those diplomatic pouches or the cards. Yes, coins are, uh, early on when I started this research, I had to make a conscious decision not to look at fakes and not to deal with coins <laughs> or Roman mm. glass because they also fall under a different category within the antiquities law because the Israel antiquities, the state of Israel sells coins. And so... <laughs> Um, it's, it's a lot more complicated, but yes, every person I meet, they want pots. And the other thing they want is a widow's mite. So the coin that the widow gave in the temple, um, where Jesus then preached, it um, was more meaningful that the widow gave her last, um, coin than it is for rich people to give the riches. And so everybody wants a widow's mite. Right. And every coin is called a widow's mite. 
Yes, and <laughs> there are a whole bunch of fakes, and there are a whole bunch of them set into jewelry, and you can get them in. You know, you can just get them in. <laughs> They're fascinating, though. I find them fascinating. <laughs> Can I ask you your uh, Vatican story? Oh, how yes. These, how these uh, parts made it into the Vatican? So, yes. Yeah, so somebody sent me that image and said it was actually um, Jamie Ellinger, who is a bioarchaeologist who has studied the early Bronze Age people from Baba Dra who were excavated in the 80s and 90s. So Jamie was in the Vatican and she said, wow, I saw these pots. I took a picture. And so I was in... Italy and Rome. Well, first of all, I used all my connections to try and get to the curator of the Vatican to figure out why, you know, to look at their archival documentation. And unlike everybody else who goes to the Vatican who wants to do the Sistine Chapel or whatever, I was alone with my pots for a really long time because nobody wants to see those. Those pots were donated by the Pontifical Biblical Institute, which is in Jerusalem and is in, I don't want to say a satellite. I don't, quite sure what their relationship is to the Vatican, but they do have a relation, like, I don't know how direct it is. Um, they were donated to the Vatican Museum um, to commemorate John Paul II. Hmm. So as I, uh, so I saw them for the first time myself in 2018, and then I was in Jerusalem in 2019, following up at the PBI with um, one of their curators there. And we were about to do a deep dive into all of the information and then COVID hits. So that's something else I will also follow up to figure out why the PBI decided that they, that I, I'm sure it has something to do with the biblical Sodom. Mm -hmm. it, has to, it has to have something to do with something mm -hmm. related to the Bible, why they would, because they have a very extensive collection of all kinds of interesting things. Why would they give a Baba Dratun group? Um, mm. so I'm still doing a deep dive on that, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. always happy to see them in various places. Mm -hmm. mm. What about the Museum of the Bible? Wouldn't they have lots of those two groups? Uh, so I have a little section in my talk on the Museum of the Bible, but I had to take it out because I know I get too excited and I spend way too long on it. Because today I just talked to you about the average tourist, right? I didn't talk to you about institutional buying or uh, individuals like Steve Green, who in the span of between 2009 and 2014 bought 40,000 artifacts, 40,000 artifacts, mm. many of which were from that legal market in Israel. Mm. So I've been doing this research since 2002, and in 2011, I noticed something weird going on in the market. And people wouldn't really talk to me the, the way they used to. I have lots of connections and people I've cultivated relationships, and nobody really wanted to tell me what was going on. And I noticed there was a lot of textual material that was for sale, a lot of incantation bowls and stuff from Mesopotamia that I'd not seen before but I just couldn't get a handle on it until I was at um, some academic meetings and Candida Moss and Joel Baden gave a talk on their book, Bible Nation, which if you haven't read, I highly recommend. It's not just about the Museum of the Bible, it's about Steve Green and his evangelical mission um, to build a museum, but also to change curriculum in Oklahoma and all kinds of things. Um, and they had, sat down with him before the museum opened and talked about, you know, did an interview. And that's when he told them that he had purchased 40,000 artifacts, um, which if you know the story, he bought 13 Dead Sea Scrolls, which now turn out to be fake. But those were probably purchased in the market in Israel because it's a very um, comforting market in that it's legal. And so you can buy these things. Mm -hmm. And then overnight, I think it was 2013, all of the Mesopotamian material in the shops disappeared. All of it, gone. And I think that coordinates with the seizure of the cuneiform tablets that had been falsely imported, you know, imported under false pretenses into the United States, which Steve Green slash Hobby Lobby, because it's hard to parse out who's who and what the relationship is, um, had to forfeit 4,500 artifacts, but also $3 million. Mm -hmm. So he was um, 
part of a civil forfeiture case. And then you get the whole also the, and the materials that he had to forfeit were purchased from Israeli dealers, but in UAE, there were all kinds of red flags. And I mean, if I was spending that kind of money, I certainly would be doing more due diligence, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. but, um, and then just recently, you probably saw the news about the Gilgamesh dream tablet, which was donated. You know, the thing about uh, Steve Green is that he builds this museum and then there's this active sort of tax haven for him where he buys antiquities, he builds a museum, he donates them to the museum and he gets a tax write-off. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's this like circle. So the, the Gilgamesh tablet was on display on loan to the um, museum and uh, it was also seized by Customs Border Control um, and then there was also a forfeiture case and they are now Steve Green suing Christie's who sold them the piece. Mm -hmm. So it's very complicated and um, yes I could go on and on and in fact I've written an article about it because it's just so fascinating. It's just like oh my god can you believe it. No, so no. could you actually see an uptick in activity when somebody suddenly buys 40,000? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because usually mm -hmm. the markets, you know, it depends on tourism, right? Mm -hmm. It's a good year. It's pretty steady, but it's not like intense. Mm -hmm. But the fact that no one would talk to me and there was not a lot of, um, and, you know, there are also market demands change. Like sometimes Russian icons are all the rage. One mm -hmm. year, my, my early Bronze Age pots were all lit right and uh, mm -hmm. so it really depends on consumer desire but all this textual material and all the mesopotamian stuff is just who is buying this and why does mm -hmm. every shop have it mm -hmm. usually some shops have higher end things and some shops have lots of oil lamps but every mm -hmm. single shop had mesopotamian material which is very unusual so i could mm -hmm. definitely see but i could not put a finger on what was moving the market or who was moving the market. Mm -hmm. And then to discover that it was one individual buying all that stuff that was moving the market is actually pretty stunning. Yeah. Thank you so much. If there are any other questions, I don't want to interrupt people or uh, keep people from asking, but it is getting late and it's really a lot later where you are. Yes, it's so I think we need to let you go. <laughs> um, but this has been great. Thanks. These were fabulous <laughs> questions. And really, I can't thank Rowan enough for getting in touch with me because this is exactly how you make these connections and you follow these pots. It's all through somebody just dropping you an email and saying, hey, I think I have one of your pots or I saw one of your pots. So I really appreciate um, all the work that they've done on this. And I'll be in touch with them because we're still working on stuff. So. And thanks to all my fan club for coming. I see you there, Jordan and Lucy. I see you, California people. <laughs> so uh, we'll, um, I, uh, I really can't thank you enough for the invite. It was really super interesting. And I will be in touch about your tune group. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.